Hello everyone, this is Senior Biotech Analyst John Vandermosten. Welcome to our channel that educates the life sciences investor on exciting advancements in drugs, biologics, and devices. For more content and news like this, subscribe to our channel below and like or share with others. Welcome to our discussion with the CEO of Achieve Life Sciences, John Bensich. Um, John, it's a pleasure to interview you again, uh, this time in person, last time we did it uh, remotely during the pandemic. Um, Achieve is working on a smoking cessation program and it features the drug cytosinicline. Uh, it has a storied history and comes from the seeds of the golden chain tree. And if you look at the history, it actually was used by Russian soldiers after World War II because they couldn't get uh, cigarettes uh, because of supply lines. Um, but it was later approved in the Eastern Bloc countries and, and the stands, as, as you had mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, now it is coming to the United States uh, through Achieve's efforts. So John, um, how, did, uh, how does cytosinicline go from being used just in the small area in, in, in Southeastern Europe uh, to be coming to the United States and potentially being approved by the FDA? Yeah, so this is a product that uh, we had searched out uh, a little over a decade ago. Uh, we had identified cytosinicline as a, a potentially great product that was under the radar. So this was a, a product that's you know, been on the market for over 20 years in Eastern Europe, uh, over which time it's treated over 20 million patients. Um, but it was never available throughout the rest of the world. Um, and our partner, uh, so Pharma, you know, their uh, expertise is really uh, Eastern focused, mm -hmm. and uh, that's really you know, where they sell all their products. And even after joining the EU about a decade ago, they still don't sell any of their products in Western Europe or rest of world. So that was the opportunity that we saw. And so we were able to get an exclusive license and supply agreement to the product um, with the goal of bringing this, this drug to the rest of the world. So they've, uh, So Pharma, your partner, they've actually mm -hmm interacted with the West before, haven't they? Yes. And, and, and perhaps uh, that, that led to one of the competing drugs that's out there now. Can you give us a little bit of that history about the, the, the previous leading drug, which is Chantix, and, and kind of how that fit into Sopharma as well? Yeah, so uh, the, the, you know, what has been the most successful product on the market uh, to date uh, is a drug called Chantix or Varenicline. Um, and this is a product that was actually developed based off of cytosinicline. Mm -hmm. um, Pfizer, who developed that drug, um, basically created an analog to, to our product. Um, but an, an imperfect copy, probably, wouldn't yes, you say? Yes, I think that's a fair, <laughs> uh, a fair assessment. So when they created uh, varenicline, they created a molecule that also has off-target effects. Mm -hmm. So that's what leads to uh, some of the poor tolerability that and, we see with that. And that's, that's what I wanted to talk about next. You know, the side effect profile of Chantix is, 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 is somewhat harsh. I mean, people complain of nausea, bad dreams, and, and a few other things as well. Um, why, why is cytosinicline materially better than, than Chantix you know, related to that side effect profile? Yeah, so there's uh, one receptor in particular that Chantix hits at a much higher level um, than we see with cytosinicline, and that's the 5-HT3 receptor. And that, um, that's the one associated with nausea? That's right? uh, exactly, yep. that's mm -hmm. uh, a receptor that, that has been well documented to cause nausea and vomiting. Um, and this is what we see with Chantix. There's about a 28% rate of nausea and vomiting that comes with that product. Uh, and it typically uh, comes in the first couple weeks of therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and on Chantix, you actually start with half a dose for the first week and you titrate up. Mm -hmm. Where with cytosinicline, historically, we've started with a high dose mm -hmm. and titrated down. Um, yet we see kind of mid single digit rates uh, in, when it comes to, to nausea. So yeah, that's pretty impressive. Very, very I mean, less, different. less than half, or around half of what um, you know the side effect profile for nausea and vomiting is about half or less than half of. Uh, yeah, I mean twenty eight percent versus about six percent. Okay, uh, so is what we've seen uh, uh, it's significant, quarter, significantly quarter, yeah, lower. It's, it's even yes. more significant than yeah. that. So um, you know you've run well. A lot of trials have been run for cytosinicline. You know if you go back 20, 30 years, I think to the nineteen seventies. Mm -hmm. um, so Pharma was running those. Or, or its predecessor, um, but those trials, the, I guess the you know the level of, of uh, wasn't up to the FDA's levels, right? Mm. So um, that's why it never got approved in Western Europe and the United States. Um, but a lot of trials have been run since then. Um, why don't you talk about what Achieve has done in phase two and in phase three so far 
to investigate the drug and, and what you found in those? those yeah, and I think a great question. You know, this was, um, you know, I think what really attracted us to this product was the extensive history. There's mm -hmm. been over 10,000 subjects as part of historical clinical trials here. So we do have a lot of support. 10,000. 10,000, yeah. yeah. So we have a lot of supporting evidence in terms of uh, the safety and efficacy from those studies. Um, but, you know, from an FDA or regulator's perspective, given the age of those studies, they weren't going to be sufficient to mm -hmm. drive this forward to approval. Um, so we were able to partner with the NIH uh, early on. Um, they uh, supported our program to the tune of about $5 million okay. uh, to update the non-clinical package. Uh, that allowed us to open up an IND um, and start to move forward in the clinic in the U.S. for the first time. So since we opened that IND up, we've completed a phase two trial uh, in 254 smokers, okay. uh, and then most recently a 810 uh, subject trial um, that just read out a couple of months ago. And, and successfully read out, I, I might add, from, from our perspective. Um, you know, one of the things that, that uh, you did that I, I thought was, that, that, that could help improve previous um, uh, success in cytosinocline is you changed the dosing and duration of the, uh, of the drug. So as you mentioned before, you started high and, and kind of came down, but you actually changed it. So overall, they're actually taking less drug, but it's more effective so far in, in trials that you've seen. That's right. Yeah. So in our phase two trial, we actually looked at uh, various doses and administrations of the product to hone in on what was the appropriate dose and administration to take forward into phase three. Mm -hmm. um, and what we found was that a, a flat, a simplified three times a day dosing mm -hmm. outperform, outperformed the historical downward titration schedule. I see. Um, and it was an unexpected result to see better efficacy out of that because we were delivering less drug overall uh, than that historical schedule. Um, and so that actually led to, I think, one of our most important patents um, that was granted by the USPTO last year. Mm -hmm. um, and this is for that current dose and administration. And that's uh, brand new. And it goes out through 2040 in terms of the protection there. Um, okay. That's, that's, that's a pretty long time, about 18 years um, that, and from, from this point forward. Uh, there's also been some uh, investigator-led trials out there that um, we found uh, to be very impressive as well that went head-to-head -head with Chantix. Uh, what did those find and, and what were your takeaways from those studies? Yeah, there's been a couple, I think, that were quite important. Uh, the first, going back before that study, <clears throat> was uh, the first ever head-to-head -head against nicotine replacement therapy, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which was designed as a non-inferiority trial, but actually showed that we were superior to nicotine replacement. Okay. Um, that was published in the New England Journal. Um, and after that study was complete, the same investigator as Dr. Natalie Walker from the University of Auckland down in New Zealand, uh, wanted to run the first ever head-to-head -head trial directly against Chantix. Uh, first one of its kind, uh, and what we saw was in terms of efficacy, uh, we met that endpoint of being at least as good as the market leader, uh, mm -hmm. and in fact, we were trending towards superiority. Um, but I think the trial got cut short, didn't it? Yeah, it was uh, under-enrolled. It was, it was meant to enroll 2,100 subjects, mm -hmm. and um, they, it was still a large trial, just under 700. Um, but uh, yeah, just mi missed on superiority. But what we did find was statistically lower rates of adverse events mm -hmm. uh, compared to Chantix, and that was across every single category. Uh, and it was about a 50% reduction uh, in overall AEs. You know, and that's mm -hmm. something we'd seen comparing across trials, uh, but to see it in the same setting uh, was a really important finding for us. And I think the dropout rate was much, much improved in cytosinocline versus Chantix as well, wasn't it? Correct. Which is an important factor when, you know, you got to finish the therapy to, to get the benefit. Yeah. So, all right. Well, John, thanks so much for uh, the additional information on cytosinocline. Uh, once again, Achieve Life Sciences, ticker symbol ACHV.